Hi, and uh, welcome to lesson four in our series about logic and the CPU. Okay, and what we're going to do today is we're going to take what you learned last week about logic gates and we're going to put them together into circuits. Okay, so uh, we're going to start just by uh, seeing what we recall from last week, though. Okay, so this is what I've got. All right, so uh, can you complete the truth table for an AND gate? Okay, so what I want you to do is uh, when I say go, I want you to pause the video for a minute and just see if you can complete the table. Okay, go. All right, hopefully you uh, you were honest and you paused the video. Okay, so let's just go through it together. So we want to complete the truth table for an AND gate. Okay, so we've got uh, uh, zero and zero. So input A and input B are both off. Okay, so that means that our output will be off okay if we have a look at the next one we've got input a is off and input b is on so that'll be off okay we've got input a is on and input b is off so that's the uh, the inverse uh, okay so that's also off and then uh, we've got input a is on and input b is on so that is when our and gate will be on Okay, so that's when our output will be on. All right, so that's the truth table for an AND gate. Hopefully you remember that from uh, learning about that from last week. Okay, so we'll just have uh, another go. All right, so this time what we've got is we've got the truth table for an OR gate. So again, I want you to take a minute and just uh, pause the video when I say go and see if you can complete the truth table for an OR gate. Okay, so go. All right, so hopefully you uh, you were honest again and uh, pause the video for a minute just to see if you can complete the table. Okay, so an OR gate is a little bit different from an AND gate. Uh, it's similar in the fact that if both inputs are off, like we've got on the top line, then our output is off. Okay, but then here is where it starts to differ. So we've got an OR gate here. Um, so this time we've got input A is off, uh, and uh, but uh, but input A is off, sorry, but input B is on. Okay, so that means it's on. So when one or the other is on, okay, so that works the other way around as well. Again, so we've got input A is on and input B is off. So one or the other is on. Okay, and then this is the bit that some people find unusual. So for an OR gate, it's one or the other or both. Okay, so we've got input A is on and input B is on. So it will be on. OK, and look, don't get uh, an OR gate confused with an XOR gate. OK, so with an XOR gate, uh, if we had uh, input A on and input B on, it would be off. But that's an XOR gate, not an OR gate. OK, so um, the final question then is to tell me the difference between an AND gate and a NAND gate. OK, so hopefully you had a go at creating a truth table last week for a NAND gate. And hopefully you thought to yourself, well, what's the difference between an AND gate and a NAND gate? OK, well, let's do the output for both and see what happens. OK, so let's split this in half. OK, and then we'll put AND here on this side and we'll put NAND on the other. All right, and let's see what happens. OK, so we've got um, input A is off and input B is off. Well, our AND gate will be off. OK, um, now we've got input A is off and um, B is on. OK, so that's still off and we've got the inverse. And so the only time that an AND gate is on is when input A and input B are both on. OK, now, so what's the difference with a NAND gate? OK, well, actually, a NAND gate is just the output from an AND gate put through a NOT gate. So it's the inverse. We call that the inverse. OK, in fact, another name for a NOT gate, uh, a NOT gate is an inverter, OK, because it inverts. So it's the inverse. OK, so um, basically what we mean by the inverse is if we've got a zero um, as the output, then through a NAND gate, that will become a one. OK, so a NAND gate is going to be 1, 1, 1 and 0. OK, and hopefully uh, that's what you found out last week when you were using logically. OK, so the extension task from last week was to see if you could work out um, what combination of gates will produce the, the following output. OK, so I was looking for um, a truth table that would produce uh, that had two inputs and two outputs. So you had to create a circuit that had two inputs and two outputs and I was looking for a circuit that would produce uh, this truth table okay now I have to shout out here to Bethany Gunn uh, she was the first person to email me with the correct answer so well done to Bethany okay um, but I'm going to quickly show you now uh, how this is uh, done okay so 
uh, what I'm going to do now then is just show you how to create a circuit that will produce the output that we've just talked about. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show you how to produce a circuit uh, that will produce uh, this output. Okay, so let's just go back to here. And uh, basically what we're looking for here then, all right, is I'll put my two inputs in. We can imagine this one's input A and this one is input B. Okay, and again, we've got two outputs. Okay, so we can say this one is output A and this one is output B. Okay, uh, now um, if we just go back to uh, the slide again, all right, I want you to notice something. Okay, so if we if we just go back to the slide, um, what I want you to do is just look at the column for output A. Okay, so just look at the column for output A. Now, uh, what logic gate matches um, that sequence of outputs? Okay, and hopefully what you notice is that actually that that the logic gate that would match that sequence of outputs is an AND gate. Okay, so I'm going to connect uh, input A and input B to an AND gate, uh, and then uh, connect that to output. A, okay, so that's going to look a little bit like this. All right, so let me just do that for you. So I'm going to grab an AND gate, okay, and I'm going to put these two, uh, I'm going to connect input A and input B, and then I said the output from that would go to output A, okay. Uh, so again, there we go. There's the first part of our circuit created, okay. So now we're just going to go uh, back, we're going to go back to the slideshow. All right, and now let's have a look at column B. Okay, so we have a look at column B. What is that the output from? Okay, so which gate would we need to connect input A and input B to to get that sequence of outputs? Okay, well, hopefully you spotted it, and we did talk about it at the start of the video. Okay, that is, of course, an XOR gate. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to connect input A and input B uh, and output B uh, to an XOR gate. So let's go back to the circuit and then let's just finish it off all right so now what we're going to do is we're going to grab an xor gate which is just there okay and we're going to wire up uh, that one from here and wire up that one from here and then we're going to wire up that to there okay and let's try it okay so if we do uh, zero plus zero we get zero zero okay let me get rid of this so if we do zero plus zero we get zero if we do zero plus one we get one, all right, if we do it the other way around. So if we do one plus zero, we get one, all right, and if we do one plus one, we get two, okay? And actually, this is called a half adder, all right? So what we've just done is we've just created a half adder circuit, all right? So well done if you managed to create that circuit. Uh, and if you did, uh, make sure you uh, upload a screenshot of it to uh, show my homework so your teacher could see. Okay, so uh, well done if you managed to get that circuit. All right, now, basically what we're going to talk about today is um, some more complex circuits. Okay, so what we've just done is we've just created a circuit uh, that can add together two one bits. Okay, so two bits. All right, um, but obviously our CPU can do far more complex things than that. Okay, so what we're going to look at today is how we get our CPU to do uh, far more complex things and we do uh, and how that happens by building circuits okay so i'm going to show you the video first all right i want you to watch the video and the video will tell you a little bit about how we create these circuits okay now obviously mechanical switches such as those are much too slow we need a way to make fast electronic switches and the key to this is a remarkable substance called a semiconductor now, a semiconductor is something that's partway between a conductor, like copper, which allows electricity to flow very easily, and an insulator, such as plastic, which doesn't allow electricity to flow at all. And it's that in-between property of semiconductors which allows them to be switched very quickly between being an insulator or a conductor and back again. Now, in fact, the very first semiconductor <laughs> was discovered here in the Royal Institution by Michael Faraday back in 1833. He was experimenting with a material called silver sulphide. This is actually quite a familiar material. I have here a silver tankard. As you can see, it's all nice and shiny. But if we leave this lying around for a few months, it becomes covered in this black tarnish. 
and that black tarnishes silver sulphide. Now Faraday discovered that silver sulphide is a semiconductor, and in his notebook he described this discovery as very extraordinary. But of course he had no idea of the huge practical impact this discovery would have over a hundred years later. Now in time other semiconductors were discovered, such as germanium and silicon. But the big breakthrough came in 1947 with the invention of this. This is called a transistor. And we can think of this as a very fast electronic switch having no moving parts. But how does a transistor work? Well, to find out, let's see how we can make a switch using water. So here I have a, a tank containing water, and we're just going to build up a little bit of pressure in this tank. So the water is now under pressure, and it would like to flow up this tube, along this tube at the top, through this valve, but this valve is closed at the moment, and then down into this collection container. Now what I'm going to do is to allow some of the high pressure water to flow into this cylinder, and it will move the piston and then open the valve. So let's see that happen. So this is now flowing into the cylinder, pushing on the piston, opening the valve, and we can see water flowing into the container. And if I turn the tap back and release the pressure in the cylinder, the valve closes again and the flow of water stops. So we've used water pressure to control the flow of water. Now water pressure is a bit like voltage in an electrical circuit, and the flow of water is a bit like electrical current. So in a transistor, we use a voltage to switch on and off an electrical current. Of course, real transistors are much faster than this. A real transistor can switch in the time it takes light to travel just a few millimetres. Now here we have a model, a cross-section model, of a transistor. And this has been magnified 10 million times. So on the scale of this transistor, the whole processor would be the size of Greater London. OK, so how does this work? Well, this is the silicon layer at the bottom here, and on the top we have three copper electrodes. Now this electrode is connected directly to the silicon, and so electricity can flow in through this electrode, through the silicon, and then out through this electrode. This is a layer of insulation, and on top we have a third electrode. Now by applying a voltage to this middle electrode, we can switch the silicon between being a conductor, in which case electricity can flow from here across to here, or being an insulator, in which case no electricity flows. The insulation is important because it stops electrical current from flowing out of this middle electrode. And in a modern microprocessor, that insulation layer is just four atoms in thickness. Now at first, transistors were packaged individually. And I have here a circuit board from a computer that was built in the early 1960s. And you can see each of these silver cans is one separate transistor. Thank you. Now the next important development was called the integrated circuit. And here we can see an example of an early integrated circuit in which four transistors have been manufactured on the same piece of silicon. Now in time, people made integrated circuits with more and more transistors on that same piece of silicon. First 10, then 20, and so on. And that was done by making the transistors smaller and smaller. Now, Gordon Moore, who founded Intel, noticed that the number of transistors on a chip seemed to be doubling every two years. And that's become known as Moore's Law. And that's continued to hold for the last 40 years. The next generation of processor will have several billion transistors on each chip. Now, microprocessors are manufactured on the surface of a thin wafer of silicon, and I have one of them here. I hope you can see this. Each of those little squares is a single microprocessor of the kind that we saw earlier. Now, to me, it seems incredible that something which is so tiny and so complex can be made at all. It sounds almost impossible. Well, to see how it's done, we're going to have a go at doing something else, which also sounds impossible. And for this, I'd like a volunteer. Should we have someone from this side? Yeah, I bet you. Would you like to come on down? (laughs) 
Take, take just ten minutes. Let's come and stand here. That's good. What's your name? Briley. Briley. Okay. Um, what's your initials? B what are your initials? BG. BG. All right. I'm going to give you a big marker pen. There we go. And I have here some rice, just ordinary rice. I'm going to take a little grain of rice. And I'm wondering, do you think you could write your initials on the side of that <laughs> grain of rice using that marker pen? Probably, uh, not. probably not. No, I think probably not either. OK. Tell you what, to make it a little bit easier, we're going to do something different. Just wait there a minute. What I have here is just a sheet of plastic. What I'd like you to do is to write your initials, nice big writing, nice big fat writing, across the middle of that plastic for me. OK? Excellent. OK, that's good. Do you want to just go over that one more time? Make it really nice and big and fat. That's it. Lots and lots of ink is really good for this. Excellent. Wonderful. OK, that's brilliant. OK, let's just pop the top back on there. Now, what we're going to do with this, if you'd like to come with me, come over here, if you'd like to stand just there, we're going to take this and I'm going to pop it in this frame like this, and I'm going to switch on this light box. So this is just a box with a bright light inside. So lots of light is coming out. It's passing through your initials and spreading out in all directions. And over here, we have a lens. And the lens is collecting some of that light and focusing it down onto this grain of rice. And we also have a camera which is looking at that little grain of rice as well. And if we can now take the feed, <laughs> if we can take the feed from that camera and bring it up on the screen, if I keep out of the way of the light, we should just, there we can see, there are your initials written on a grain of rice. Okay? <laughs> OK, I'd like to do one more thing. Hold up your hand like this and put it in front of your initials, in front of the light box. That's it. And then hold it flat like that in front of the light box. That's it. And now just move it gently about. And we can see <laughs> an image of your hand. OK. OK, thank you very much indeed. So to make a microprocessor, we can lay out the design of the processor on a large scale and then use a projection technique just like this to shrink it down to a very small scale. So we've seen how to project an image down to a small size, but how can we use this to make a microprocessor? Well, here I have a piece of a microprocessor that's partway through being manufactured. In fact, it's just the transistor that we saw earlier. And we're going to see how to lay down, how to create those three copper electrodes. And to help us do this, we have two workers from the microprocessor factory. OK, and uh, we'll find out in a minute why they're dressed in these strange costumes. So how are we going to make this microprocessor? Well, at the bottom here, we have the, the layer of silicon. And we've already put down the insulation layer. And the next stage is to lay down a complete layer of copper across the whole surface of the wafer. And then on top of the copper, we put down another layer of special material that's sensitive to light. The next thing we then do is to project an image of the copper wiring onto the top surface. So if you can bring on the light, please. So this pattern of light is the pattern of copper that we want to create on the surface of the wafer. Now the light is causing a chemical change in the material in this top layer. OK, we can switch the light off now, please. And the next stage is to wash the wafer in a special chemical that dissolves away this green layer. But it only dissolves the material that wasn't exposed to light. So if we can just remove these two pieces now, please. Excellent. OK, so the next stage is to wash the, wafer, wash the wafer in acid. Now, acid dissolves copper, but it only dissolves the copper where the copper is exposed. The copper that's underneath these green regions is protected. So let's add our acid and remove those two pieces then, please. Good. And now the final stage is to use yet another chemical to remove all the remaining green layer. So if you'd like to remove those two pieces, and I'll give you a hand with this middle piece. OK, so now we've created our pattern of copper wiring. And if we just bring that light back on for a moment, we can see that the pattern of copper corresponds exactly to the pattern of light. 
And we can do this for the hundreds of millions of transistors on the microprocessor all at the same time. Now, all of this has to be done under incredibly clean conditions. In fact, it's 10,000 times cleaner than an operating theatre. Now, to see why, imagine that just one speck of dust got into the optical projection system. We'd get an image of the speck of dust. Now, on the scale of this transistor, a speck of dust is 100 metres across. <laughs> so if we get an image of a speck of dust instead of an image of the wiring, we've ruined the circuit. And that's why Alex here and Elaine are dressed in these rather strange-looking suits. They're called bunny suits. Is it hot in there? Boiling. Is it? Yeah, it looks really hot. <laughs> so these suits are not there to protect the workers. They're there to protect the microprocessor from any dust which they might bring with them into the factory. OK, we'll say thank you to our volunteers and join me again after the break. OK, so um, hopefully this helped us understand how we get these circuits uh, onto our CPU. Okay, so how do we create a CPU? We're basically creating these very complex, uh, very, very complex circuits. Okay, now uh, what's really, really interesting or really interesting to me is um, people like Intel and AMD, all right, they don't just use, uh, they, they don't use lots and lots of different gates like we've been learning about, okay? In fact, what they do is they just use one particular gate, okay? Now, it turns out, and I'm going to show you in a minute how, but it turns out that you can make any gate, okay? Um, so you can make any gate from one particular gate and combining that gate in lots and lots of different ways, you can make uh, lots and lots of different gates, okay? So I'm going to show you that very, very quickly. So let's go back to our circuit, okay? And I, I'm just going to, uh, maybe I'll just create a new one. OK, I'm not going to save that. So I'm going to show you how I can create a NOT gate, that inverter, OK, from a, a NAND gate. OK, so I'm going to grab a NAND gate. OK, now look what I can do. OK, so remember a NOT gate is the only one that has one input. All right, so I've got one input here and I've got one output. Now, if you remember rightly, a NOT gate is an inverter. OK, so let's just wire it up this way. All right. And basically what I'm going to do here is I'm going to wire this up like this. OK, now hopefully you remember that a NOT gate is an inverter. Uh, and hopefully you can see it here, OK, that I've actually managed to create a NOT gate because my switch is off, but my output is on. OK, and if I reverse that, so now my switch is on, my output is off. OK, so using a NAND gate, I have managed to create uh, I've managed to create a NOT gate, all right? Now, you can experiment, and I'd like you to experiment a little bit uh, and have a go, and hopefully what you'll work out is that actually you can make any of those gates that we learned about, an OR gate, an AND gate, um, a NOT gate, an XOR gate, you can make all of those from NAND gates, okay? Now, you are going to have a practice at that for your task, okay? So your task today, your task this week, uh, sorry, is to go to this website, okay? So you're going to go to www.nandgame.com, all right? And basically what you are going to see is you're going to see how far you can get, okay? Now, the aim is to see if you can get as far as building a full adder circuit, all right? Now, if you can get, uh, you may want to try going past a full adder circuit, and if you can do that, that's absolutely fine, okay? Okay. Um, but what I want to see is to see if you can get to a full adder, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you how it works, um, and then uh, uh, my video will finish, okay? So let's just have a look. So this is what the game looks like, all right? And basically what it says is, first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to do what I have just done, okay? So we're going to create uh, an inverter, a NOT gate, uh, from a NAND gate, okay? So we've got our toolbox here. This is, this is what you're allowed to use. All right, and again, what we do is we can just wire it up. So we already know how we're going to wire it up. So we're going to wire up our NAND gate to our output over here. And we know that we're going to wire up both inputs to our NAND gate to our one input. Okay, and there we go. All right, so what we're looking to do is we're trying to match uh, the, the truth table over here. Okay, so if we just test this, get rid of all of this. Okay, uh, we can see if we've matched it. All right, so we can, uh, let's see. So we can just turn this on and it's off, all right, and it goes off, and it's on, okay, so we've matched the truth table, so we can just go, I've completed the level, all right, and we go to the next level, 
And then basically it tells you, so what it now does is you've now got an extra tool in your toolbox because you've now just created a not gate or an inverter. All right, so it now wants you to have a go at creating an AND gate. So you're going to have to have an experiment and have a look and have, see if you can work out how to turn uh, what you've got here in your toolbox into an AND gate. Okay, so that is your task uh, for this week. All right, so as always, um, it's been uh, great talking to you. I will see you next week for uh, Lesson 5, okay? Love to see you.